Um, welcome to this uh, webinar, Radiation and Women's Health. It's part of CND's programme of events to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Nagasaki in August 1945. Of course, this is a very timely discussion. Countless thousands died as a result of the radioactive fallout from the bombs, and many had their lives and those of succeeding generations blighted by its impact. Now, originally, we had planned to have this as a day-long in-person seminar, but unfortunately, COVID-19 has intervened. But nevertheless, I would like to thank all those who helped in planning for that original event with a special mention for Ray Street. Thanks for all the work you put in, Ray. Really appreciate it. So we're keeping an open mind on uh, when and if we will convene um, a full in-person seminar in future, maybe sometime next year. And if we do that, we'll keep all you attendees uh, informed of our plans. So today, it's a great pleasure to welcome Mary Olson of the Gender and Radiation Impact Project in the US and Cindy Falkers from Beyond Nuclear, also from the US. We'll be viewing short videos from each of them followed by Q&A with you, the audience. So big thanks to Mary and Cindy. After that, we'll be discussing what can be done to improve matters, what kind of policy changes and practical steps are necessary. And for that part of the discussion, please use the Q&A and chat functions uh, at the bottom of your screen. And in fact, please do use those as we go along and the speakers will uh, contribute or respond um, if they have time to do so. Please feel free also to put links and uh, useful information in the chat box as well. But before we turn to our keynote US speakers, I would like to welcome Dr. Ian Fairley, well known to many of you. Ian is a vice president of CND. He's our science advisor, and he's a leading consultant on radioactivity in the environment. And he will just kick us off by briefly outlining the concerns that exist about radiation risks. Ian, over to you. Unmute, you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> We're all going to do that. Cindy and Mary, I'm sure you won't do that. Okay. Can you hear me now? Good, good, good. I'd like to add my welcome to Kate's welcome to all the participants here today. We've got a very good number and we're very pleased. Now, radiation risks depend on many factors, including age and exposure, your uh, current age, your gender, the type of radiation, whether, whether the radiation is external or not, and your genetic profile. Um, it's radiation is not really an issue which you can grasp readily uh, all at one time. So what we're doing, we're doing it bit by bit here. And today we're discussing um, gender issues. Um, and uh, one of the key issues that we'll learn today is that official radiation standards and safety limits, both here in Europe and in the United States, are sadly not fit for purpose and really need to be strengthened. Um, the thing is that apart from gender, that embryos, fetuses, neonates, babies, infants, children are also much more sensitive to radiation than adults. But you'd never know that from the current radiation standards. The present annual radiation limit is one millisievert per year, a sievert as a unit of radiation. This applies to all persons, regardless of their age, gestational status, their gender, whether they're pregnant or not, and their any genetic predisposition. But it's not just who isn't covered by the present regulations. We must also look at what risks are not covered. For example, 
current radiation limits only apply to the risk from fatal cancer. <laughs> but there's lots more adverse effects from radiation, including non-fatal cancers, for example, cardiovascular diseases and strokes, birth defects, endocrine disruption, cataract induction, and adverse mental effects. And that's just for starters. Many concerns exist among some scientists, anyway, and the public about radiation risks. In particular, are the radiation risks posited by official bodies such as the ICRP, UNSCARE, WHO, and IEA, are they correct? For example, are the official models used to collect uh, internal radiation doses, are they correct? Uh, we don't really know very well. Ideally, we need to examine these questions over a longer conference, as Kate mentioned. And, but perhaps we can do this over a series of Zoom seminars, given the recurring COVID-19 pandemic. For example, CND might in future look at convening other Zoom meeting seminars on the specific topics of children's susceptibility to radiation, and the risk of cardiovascular disease and strokes. This is uh, the latter, in other words, cardiovascular and strokes is an important matter because if they were properly taken into account, they would at least double the risks of dying from radiation exposures. Anyway, that's all for the future. But for today, we're now going to hear from our featured speakers. Thanks very much. Thanks very much indeed, Ian. So, we're now proceeding to the uh, video contributions from our two US guests. First of all, uh, we're hearing from Mary, but before um, we put up the, uh, the video, I'm just going to say a little bit more about Mary's expertise. Mary is the founder and acting director of the Gender and Radiation Impact Project. Uh, dedicated to supporting scientific research into biological sex differences in rates of harm from ionizing radiation exposure, as well as other gendered factors in radiation impact. Mary was a senior radioactive waste specialist at Nuclear Information and Resource Service for 28 years. And during that time, she gave expert consultation on radiation relevant to the development of a new treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons to the UN missions of Ireland and Austria, as well as the International Committee of the Red Cross and Red Crescent. And Mary, that's going to be music to the ears of so many CND supporters, because we're, as you know, really, really strong supporters of the TPNW, and we're looking forward to it coming into force. Uh, in the next few months. So that's absolutely fantastic. So um, we're going to show the video now uh, and then please have your direct questions ready for Mary um, to respond to afterwards. Okay, over to Sarah on the technical side. Um, Sarah, we don't have any sound here. Okay. Slight technical problem, so just bear with us momentarily. It's to be here today, and we're going to focus more broadly on gender and nuclear weapons. Thank you for this opportunity to speak, and thank you, all of you, for listening. My, li my slides will be published online with citations and references. 
A nuclear explosion is composed of three types of energy, blast, heat, and radiation. All three have immediate and long-term medical consequences. Today I will focus on the long-term medical impacts of ionizing radiation. I urge you to visit the exhibit in the lobby, now here at the UN, cries from Hiroshima and Nagasaki to see the immediate medical impacts of the other types of energy. I use icons to track each type. Yellow is blast, red is thermal, orange is immediate gamma neutron radiation, and purple is the longer lasting radioactivity from atomic fission products. Today, nuclear weapons are very much larger than in 1945, but the forces are the same. This photo was taken from the plane that dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. It is a mistake to say that this photo is of the bomb. This cloud is what was moments before buildings, trees, homes, girls, boys, men, and women. A nuclear detonation is inherently indiscriminate. And this was the city of Nagasaki. I need to acknowledge the personal side of this. I rely on data that came from the studies of people who survived those bombs. My government chose to use the first nuclear weapons on cities full of people. Five years later, the U.S. initiated a long-term study of the atomic bomb survivors. Researchers assumed that a humanitarian aid might skew the results of their study, so medical treatment was not offered by the researchers. This data is used widely, including by me here today. Speaking only as one woman, I need to say I'm very sorry. I deeply regret this history. Nagasaki, 1945, the church is in both frames. Today, the weapon that le leveled Nagasaki would be considered tactical. Today's weapons are very much larger. The blast and heat destroyed structures and killed indiscriminately. Radiation levels at the epicenter were lethal. Only those with shielding survived. At least 150,000 men, women, and children died in 1945 from these two weapons and probably around 250,000 over time. Radiation is invisible, but we can see the damage it has done to these chromosomes. Children's bodies are small, so the same amount of radiation delivers a larger dose. Since children are growing, the cells in their bodies are dividing more rapidly. DNA is more likely to be damaged in cell division. Cancer is the most studied long-term consequence of non-lethal radiation exposure. When genetic material inside a cell is damaged, sometimes our bodies can repair that damage. Otherwise, the abnormal cell may sit quietly in the body for years, even decades, before it makes us sick. There is no way to predict which exposure will result in cancer. In general, more radiation equals more cancer risk. However, an exposure too small to measure could sometimes result in cancer death. Regulatory agencies acknowledge there is no safe dose of ionizing radiation. Radiation is not safe for males, but new findings show that ionizing radiation is more harmful for females. There is a gender factor. Field and lab studies show that plants, insects, and animals are harmed by ionizing radiation, including natural background radiation. In 1942, our species began splitting atoms, resulting in massive new radioactivity that is impacting all of life. This is a very famous report, The Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation, number seven, also called Beer 7. The data is primarily from 93,000 survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This is the largest data set, which includes all ages and both genders. Beer 7 was published in 2006 after the youngest of the A-bomb survivors turned 60. Hence, it is also called the Lifespan Study. And it is the source for the data of the findings I will present now. 
The survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were grouped by the age they were at the time of the bombing. These groups were tracked over their lifetimes. Cancers and cancer deaths were counted. There are many problems with this data, but we can broadly say that those who were five years or younger in August 1945 had the most cancer at some point in their lives. Girls in this group were twice as likely, girls in this group were twice as likely to get cancer at some point than were boys. For every male in the zero to five year cohort that suffered, can suffered cancer at some point in his life. The Beer 7 report is where these numbers are found. The report itself does not discuss why gender is a risk factor. I published my findings in 2011. Independent from my work, Dr. Arjun Makajani published the same findings in 2006. Here is the same information in graphical form. The pink line is girls, the blue line is boys. We can easily see the gender difference and that it is greatest in young children. The entire graph is a snapshot of our species cancer response to acute radiation exposure. It's extremely important to understand that little girls are not a subpopulation. We are an inextricable link in the human life cycle. Gender was also a factor for those who were adults at the time of the bombings. Over their lifetime, women were ex over their lifetime, women exposed as adults suffered 50% more cancer death than did men in the same group. For every two men in these cohorts who died of cancer, three women died of cancer. Why is gender a risk factor for cancer due to harm from radiation? Today, we do not know. Dr. Rosalie Bertel suggested that maybe it was because female bodies have more sensitive reproductive cells. Maybe it's the percentage of fatty tissue. Maybe it's endocrine differences. These questions have not yet been asked, let alone answered. It took 60 years to see this gender difference. On this slide, the green circle is the reference man, corresponding to an adult male military or paramilitary atomic worker of the 1940s or 1950s. The rest of the slide I made gray because decision makers have not seen information about males of other ages or any information about females until very recently. We have been invisible. In order to ensure the viability of our species over time, radiation regulations must promote and protect the entire life cycle. They should be centered on the most radiosensitive phase, which is girls zero to five on this graph, where I've put the big X. This approach is not happening. It is not even being discussed in regulatory agencies. The APOM survivor data is incomplete. The studies and data collection began in 1950, five years after the bombs. Many who survived the initial blasts then died in the next few years. These deaths are not part of the data set. As a result, the group that was studied is strong, stronger than a typical human population. The epicenter of an atomic blast gets one fast pulse of gamma rays and neutrons. The source is external to the body, like x-rays in the left side of the slide. The fallout traveled away from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Internal exposures were not included in this lifespan study. Fission products like cesium, strontium, and plutonium contaminate air, food, and water getting inside our bodies. Internal radioactivity is very different. The right photo is of a bit of plutonium in lung tissue. The black areas are dead cells due to very high local radiation exposures at close range. This is very different from an X-ray. More than 2,000 nuclear explosions have already occurred on our planet, and it is already contaminated, even without waging a full-scale nuclear war. We can see the radioactivity in our environment shows up in samples of living tissue, 
This is known as the body burden. We do not know if gender is a factor in the risk of harm from internal radiation sources. Fission also happens at 390 nuclear reactors worldwide. Each red dot is a nuclear reactor. Each of these sites splits as many atoms in one year as 1,100 A-bombs. Already, major reactor accidents contaminate large areas of land, water, and air. Chernobyl is on the left with a large scale of Europe, and Fukushima is a local scale on the right. This picture shows three generations, the mother, the growing fetus, and the primary germ cells for the next generation are there too. The egg you came from was formed inside your maternal grandmother. Your father's spermatogonia were formed inside your paternal grandmother. The primary germ cells form an unbroken chain back to the beginning of our species. Dr. Alice Stewart called childhood cancer a post-birth defect. Radiation impacts our cells. When the reproductive cells are harmed, deformations are one outcome. This happens to all babies, plants, animals, humans. We also suffer loss of fertility, spontaneous abortion and miscarriage, possible heritable mutations, avoidance of reproduction due to uncertainty. While reducing reproductive rate of our species may be a good thing, these issues have to do with our long-term capacity to reproduce at all. Fission results in massive release of ionizing radiation. Earth's biosphere is being challenged in ways we cannot foretell. And finally, this is a picture of health. These women recently stopped a nuclear waste dump from coming to their people's traditional lands. Radiation prevention is more than avoiding harm. It is a source of health and empowerment. In Vienna, I said these words in a new way. Prevention is the cure. And the future is in our hands. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thanks. Thanks, Mary. That, that was just incredible. I mean, so informative and also incredibly moving and then inspirational at the end. So absolutely fantastic. Um, so we do have some uh, questions that um, I'll put them to you um, one at a time. So um, first of all, from Britta Forstrom, thank you to Mary Olson. This UN report is dated 2015. Has there been any further research since then to establish why females are more likely to die from cancer? Um, thank you. I, I do want to just reflect that that was a side session on the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review session at the UN in 2015. And no, there has not yet been true engagement. There's not been major funding, which is what we need. We need a new generation of Ians and Jills and Kates and other people who are ready to step up and do, do these questions, do this research, do peer review. We need a literature and we don't have it yet. Okay, thanks very much. And then um, another one from uh, an activist here from Linda Albridge. Uh, she says, hi from Salisbury. I was at Greenham and Burfield peace camps in the past. She's wondering if radiation from Burfield and Aldermaston, which I'm sure you know and others uh, may know, uh, that's where our atomic bombs, nuclear bombs are made here in Britain, if radiation from Burfield and Aldermaston in particular could have affected women. So women who've been at peace camps, do they have anything to fear from their proximity to those bases. One of the primary routes that radioactivity would reach the public from making nuclear weapons as compared to um, some other activities uh, is through contamination of air and water and food 
We don't actually know whether there's a gender difference for internal exposure, but we do know it is terribly harmful. And I do know that it's one of the places where I believe we need the greatest revision of the regulatory approach because the regulators simply take an internal uh, deposition and distribute it across the whole body as if it were external because their only basis for assessing risk are the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which was an external exposure. So the truth is nobody knows, but everybody knows that it is harmful. The question is how much were women actually exposed to discharges? I believe they probably were. These factories are industrial sites that discharge to air, to water, they carry off waste, workers come and go, they're not sealed. Absolutely, there's radioactivity that comes out. Absolutely, people near those areas, whether they're protesting or living, conducting their lives, you know, janitorial staff, clerical staff, all kinds of people are exposed in those settings and deserve better protection. Absolutely. Um, and there's another question that's come in. I can see you've answered it directly to the uh, questioner, but I, maybe you could just comment for everyone's interest. Um, this is for, from Joyce Yandola, and she says, why is this issue still not being considered in radiation effects currently? She goes on to say that her father was involved in the Adrian report, which came out in the late 50s or early 60s. His PhD thesis was on the effects of ionizing radiation on the reproductive organs. Why is this issue still not in current use? So I'm sure we'd all like to hear about that. Yeah, um, first I wanna just comment that in the United States, the Environmental Protection Agency about 20 years ago did notice that there was a difference between males and females. Again, radiation is harmful to everyone. We are not saying it's safe for males. However, they did notice that difference. And their response was to take the population, adjust it for the percentage of females, and then average what they viewed as the difference with no respect for age whatsoever. And they seemed unable to comprehend that if a child has been exposed, they grow up into an adult who's now in this population that's the only one they consider are adults. All the regulations are based on adults few exceptions, you know, I'm not saying there isn't ever a case where they consider a, a critical group or a maximally exposed individual, those exceptions, but in the most part, they're looking at adults and when they consider gender at all, they do this weird thing of just saying, well, there's an average in between. And the same thing is happening in Europe with the reference individual with ICRP suggesting that they blend a male and female body into some weird uh, by gendered individual, which again completely misses the point that childhood exposure is where the difference is greatest and that all women were, were little girls at one time and that we're talking about the lifetime risk, not childhood cancer, but total cancer incidence across the lifespan. In that picture, you have to start looking at life cycle to be accurate and no regulatory agency is doing that. Okay, thanks. Um, and then question from me, if you don't mind. Um, Not at all. Something struck me as you were talking. Um, very often when we've been raising the question of radiation, and particularly I came across it when we uh, had some activities down at Plymouth, where there's the Devonport Dockyard, nuclear dockyard, which has uh, nuclear subs being refitted there and so on. And people would quite often say, oh no, it's not harmful. You have radiation in nature. There's background radiation. That's fine. You know, no problem. And in your uh, film, I think you, you mentioned that background radiation could actually be harmful. Could you explain a little more about that? Sure. Um, when I started working in this field in the early 1990s, the evaluation of background radiation was between uh, 0.8 and 1 millisievert per year as what everyone on average got on the planet. We know that background radiation is not average, it's quite variable, but that was the evaluation as a, as a general rule. Meanwhile, our federal regulator who licenses the fleet of reactors and other sites evaluated the impact of one millisievert per year over a lifetime of 70 years 
and came up with the one in every 286 people die of fatal cancer from that level of exposure, from what they were calling the average natural background. Well, one in 286 is very low compared to our current rates of cancer, but it's not that low compared to industrial operations supposedly causing one in a million to have a, a harm, or one in 100,000 to have a harm, or even at the Superfund sites in the United States, the goal is one in 10,000. So the fact that background radiation and also their regulatory limits for public exposure, also one millisievert, are evaluated at one in 286 reference men, thank you very much. All of them are reference men in this picture. Um, it, it's just astounding, absolutely astounding. Mm. Okay, thanks. That's very helpful. And we've just got time for one more, I think. Um, John Morris is putting a question. Hi, John. He says, is the population of the world still being affected by the nuclear tests undertaken in the past by the countries with nuclear weapons? Could you comment on that? Absolutely. Um, the largest distribution of radioactivity by humankind uh, is of course post-fission, 1942 on, and 2,000 detonations have occurred. Some of them are uh, definitely underground, but many of those leaked. Uh, for the most part, they're over, but we do know there's a little dribble still going on here and there. And every single one of them has been documented to have released radioactivity. And of course, the atmospheric testing was the largest amount, went worldwide, primarily in the Northern Hemisphere, but Great Britain took care of the Southern Hemisphere and France and several other nations tested down there too. So the long and the short is that cesium and strontium are the biologically most active in some respects. Tritium uh, also have relatively short half-lives. We're through one half-life of the Chernobyl deposition. Uh, now we're into uh, one to two half-lives since the atmospheric test ban uh, prohibition came in. And uh, so we're, we're getting there, but half-lives are half of it's reduced. And it takes 10 of those to get down to a barely detectable level. 20, if you want to say, you know, we're taking care of the lower activity uh, portions of the fallout. And the fallout got cycled into trees and shrubs that then get cut for firewood and then it gets re-released. Re All of the stuff that ends up in the sludges of rivers and estuaries gets turned over every time there's a big um, event in those areas. So the cycling of this stuff through our living system has never ended. And mm -hmm. so yes, we are all still being exposed. I thought your slide actually in your presentation about the tests was very uh, revelatory because you know, I think many people aren't aware of the extent of the testing in the atmosphere that took place and um, just before we move on briefly um, there's great concern here about President Trump's recent suggestion or consideration that they might begin uh, or resume nuclear weapons testing in the United States so that's I mean obviously there's been international outcry from the CTBTO and so on but Obviously, that's deeply, deeply worrying for all the reasons. We are deeply worried, and unfortunately, our media is not covering it to the extent it is being covered outside our country. So um, thank you for continuing to raise it. Thanks very much. Um, we need to move on to the next, um, next video now, but um, there is, there's another question in, in chat from Rebecca Warren about um, the background radiation question, if anyone's got time to take a look and reply to that. So now um, we're going to move on to uh, Cindy's video. So I'm just going to say a little bit more about Cindy before Sarah puts up your video. Um, Cindy is the radiation and health hazard specialist at Beyond Nuclear. She has a master's degree in environmental science from Johns Hopkins University. And she studied ionizing radiation and its impact on health and the environment for over 25 years. She focuses on the disproportionate impacts of radiation on children, women, 
and pregnancy. So thank you. Um, and now we'll go over to Sarah to put that video up for us. Thank you. What are the risks of allowing increasing radiation exposure? There are a number of ways national and international entities fail to address increasing exposures to ionizing radiation. Sometimes they even advocate for increases. However, research indicates that increasing radiation exposure, even by what some experts consider small amounts, can increase the amount of cancer and non-cancer disease, and that early life stages like pregnancy and childhood will be the most negatively impacted. We'll start by examining recommendations by one important international committee. It's the International Commission on Radiological Protection. The ICRP is a self-selected, self-appointed body of experts whose proclamations are often used by regulatory agencies to construct radiation exposure regulations. A number of recommendations they make don't account for important potential damage, and some might actually be resulting in more exposure and greater health risk. One recommendation quoted here is the encouragement of growing, selling, and consuming contaminated food as an economic imperative for those areas such as areas around Chernobyl and Fukushima. ICRP recommendations also have a number of shortcomings when assessing radiation damage to future generations and early life stages like pregnancy. For instance, ICRP fails to account for radiation damage past the second generation because it feels it doesn't have enough information to calculate this impact. However, for the two generations of exposure they do calculate, the genetic disease per million people increases from the first generation to the next, even while each generation is receiving the same dose. This trajectory of increasing damage across generations should make humanity very skeptical of allowing ever more radiation exposure, including low dose chronic exposures. ICRP says that lifetime cancer risk following in utero exposure will be like leukemia, this may not be the case, since hematopoietic or blood-making tissues appear to be more radiation-sensitive in embryos and fetuses than they do in newborns. And in fact, ICRP admits that its recommendations do not account for develop developmental changes and damage to all the sites and stem cells that are responsible for hematopoietic for formation. ICRP uses uterine dose to determine embryo dose. However, this does not account for the maternal exchange system during pregnancy, stem cell vulnerability, or any difference between fully formed organ heart, spinal cord and brain, major blood vessels, and the beginnings of bones and muscles are in process of forming from single cells. ICRP recognizes that averaging of dose over the uterus hides the fact that the very early embryo with a small number of cells might receive significantly lower or higher doses than this average. But ICRP is content to quote unquote, let future developments correct for this. Unfortunately, people are being exposed now and pressure is on now to force resettlement to areas of unsafe contamination after catastrophic releases of radioactivity. ICRP uses models made for postnatal exposures to calculate radiation damage to prenatal tissues and organs. ICRP mentions the shortcomings of this approach, but says it does this because there is a lack of data about damage at these early life stages, and because using this method makes it more convenient for comparing dose data over a lifetime. While ICRP at least admits shortcomings in other areas of pregnancy protection, it seems blind to the unique role of the placenta during pregnancy. 
So the placenta is a temporary but immensely important structure that performs organ-like functions. It supplies oxygen, removes metabolic products, and it provides a limited barrier for certain toxins and drugs. It is active endocrinologically to support the ongoing pregnancy, so radiation damages not only fetal cells, but also impairs placental development and function by cell killing and cell cycle arrest. Improper placental formation or function can cause a high or low birth weight for babies, which in turn seems to be connected to disease later in adult life. Not only international committees, but internationally recognized researchers have downplayed data showing health impacts like childhood leukemia. And in the case I'm highlighting here, US experts claimed there is not solid evidence for childhood leukemia increases following exposure to Chernobyl radioactivity. They claimed the data that were used to show such an increase might be subject to bias. However, detailed statistical analysis of these data demonstrate that they were not biased and that in fact there was an increase in the amount of childhood leukemia after Chernobyl. But the researchers who claimed to the contrary originally still don't admit that they are wrong. Researchers further conclude that natural and man-made background gamma radiation appear to be associated with childhood cancers, with leukemia and central nervous system cancers being a higher risk. However, residing near a nuclear power reactor also appears to be associated with increases in childhood leukemia, yet researchers hesitate to admit a connection between radioactivity from nuclear power reactors and childhood leukemia. Now, why would this be? Well, it could be because background gamma is directly measurable, so the doses are less of a guess, and that makes for a more reliable study conclusion. Also, the populations exposed to gamma background are higher, so health impacts are easier to see among a larger population. So when researchers like Dr. E, Drs. Ian Fairley and Dr. Alfred Korblein pooled health data from four European country studies that were conducted around nuclear reactors, they found a 37% increase in childhood leukemia that wasn't really attributable to factors other than radioactivity. It is illogical to ignore that radioactivity from nuclear power reactors can impact human health when we have evidence of negative impact from readily measurable natural and man-made background radiation, yet some researchers do ignore it. The studies referenced in this slide are all studies performed in Europe. The U.S. has canceled its childhood cancer study around nuclear facilities and doesn't seem to have a plan to replace it. Non-cancer impacts can be subtle but detrimental. For instance, radioactivity appears to act along the estrogen pathway, and this action could at least partially explain both early and developing life stage increased sensitivity and adult female sensitivity to ionizing radiation. In 2011, a medical hypothesis was published highlighting this interaction, and I quote from the conclusion of this study, quote, the impact of estrogen and estrogen receptors on the response of living organisms, including humans, after exposure to ionizing radiation should be included in future in radiation safety regulations. A different study that examined prenatal Chernobyl radiation exposure in Sweden found that neural development is compromised at very low doses of radiation and that this low radiation could therefore also be responsible for other subclinical negative health impacts that would be harder to spot, much less attribute to a precipitating cause. This impact on neural development over the longer term was greater for those whose parents had less education. Radiation is released routinely, but it is also released in spikes. We know this thanks to the German Green Party, who pressured local government officials to release actual real-time data, not averaged data, for a single German nuclear power reactor, the data of which is shown in this graph. You see the spike? The emissions data in the U.S. are also given as an average where these spikes would have been smoothed out. And there is no reason to believe that reactors in the U.S. don't release in spikes as well during refueling outages and routine maintenance. And since timing matters during pregnancy and the sensitive and unique developmental processes that are occurring, U.S. citizens deserve to know what is being released in real time, in other words, while it is being released. 
Had the U.S. study on childhood cancer gone forward, it would not have had this real-time data to its detriment, in my opinion. Knowledge that radiation can be released in spikes is also important because it could provide partial explanation for why we see increases in childhood leukemia around reactors when the doses are supposedly too low to be causing it. Also note that the lowest daily release, according to this graph, which was about three kilobecquerel per meter cubed, was still hundreds of times higher than natural radioactivity in air from radon. I believe that it was when they opened the core to change the fuel, yes. I don't remember for sure, but I have it somewhere, but I believe that's what it was. Two U.S. agencies, thank you, uh, Environmental Protection Agency and Nuclear Regulatory Commission have made various attempts to revisit the current national radiation still in process. EPA issued protective action guides for officials to follow in the event of catastrophic releases of radioactivity, but EPA's levels are already shown to increase negative childhood impacts. They would have the first year everybody exposed to 20 millisieverts, 5 millisieverts per year thereafter. And while the EPA claims that these levels will be temporary, there is no guarantee that eventual relocation to areas of lower exposure will actually occur. For the first time since instituted in 1977, the EPA is considering revising its radiation exposure standards for public from regularly released radiation. A rewrite of these standards will not account for damage from carbon-14 or tritium, however, and the EPA claims that it doesn't have to regulate for these isotopes because they can't be removed from the environment once released anyway. This is unfortunate and illogical because these isotopes can concentrate in fetal tissue to twice the amount that they concentrate in maternal tissue. The NRC, for its part, accepted three petitions to consider replacing a more protective cancer risk model called the linear no threshold model with one which claims a possible benefit to health at low doses, termed hormesis. However, research indicates that a hormetic effect, if it exists, isn't changing the cancer outcome for those exposed. And despite hormesis, early life stage vulnerability remains. NRC is also looking at revising its radiation standards. It also, it already bases its standards on ICRP and would update with current ICRP recommendations, which as we saw earlier in this presentation, are still not protective enough of females and early life stages. And there is no indication that NRC will lower its 100 millirem per year allowance dose for members of the public, although it should, because this dose represents a doubling of what is the unavoidable dose we receive annually from radioactivity. So, the theme running through all of the recommendations for early life stages seems to be, when in doubt, expose anyway and hope nothing bad happens. But knowing for certain what will happen, or not, or not knowing for certain what will happen, is still no excuse for not protecting public health now, especially since strong evidence exists that exposure to low radiation doses during early life stages can be detrimental not only during pregnancy and childhood, but also into adulthood. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. That was fantastic. A lot to take in there, but brilliant. Um, okay, so while I'm waiting for people to put their Q and A, their Q up in the Q and A box, <laughs> Cindy, I've got a question for you as well. Um, it a little bit relates to one of the graphs in Mary's presentation. So when it came to the life uh, kind of life cycle patterns of males and females, both were going down, you know, coming down to pretty negligible, you know, in the sort of 60s to 80s kind of thing. Whereas obviously in early life, the female um, line was, was much higher. Um, and then in, in yours, there was a, a section about estrogen and so on. And I was wondering, you know, what, is it that estrogen makes women more vulnerable? Or is there some kind of issue around that? Because it looked in, in Mary's graph as if 
postmenopausal women, women no longer had a higher sensitivity to it. You know, they'd just gone to the same level as men. Or is it something just to do with the inevitable, um, you know, life cycle thing? I mean, is, is there a relationship between those things? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could actually answer that question for sure? Here's the thing about the estrogen. You can hear me? Yeah. Okay. Here's the thing about the estrogen. We have known at least since 1960 that estrogen or hormones anyway ha is a, a radiation co-carcinogen. We have known that, I know that we've known that because I just pulled a, a Federal Radiation Council report from, the 19, from 1960. So it was published in 1960. So they suspected that there was a problem early, early on. And we still, as of the paper that I referenced in my presentation in 2000, which was published in 2011, we still don't have answers to these questions. And frankly, they're pretty basic questions. And I think that at least in part, the question of estrogen goes to the question of why uh, women and children, male and female children, are more susceptible. Because estrogen is instrumental in healthy pregnancy. Estrogen is instrumental when uh, both males and females go through puberty. And of course, women have estrogen, as you mentioned, until menopause. So it actually is unconscionable to me that we don't have any more of an answer to your question right now than what I have provided. Okay, well, let's, <laughs> in future, there will be answers, but you know, that, that is very interesting. Uh, and then in chat, um, we've got uh, from Maya. Uh, Thank you, Cindy, excellent presentation. The management of tritium is especially concerning. Did you see the new study on beta emissions by Aaron Datesman? And perhaps you could just say a little bit about tritium for the benefit of the rest of us. So tritium is a beta emitter. It is radioactive hydrogen. It comes out of reactors routinely and also during um, um, accidents. Uh, especially in Canada, because of the kind of nuclear reactor they have, they release a lot of tritium. Um, it has a half-life of about 12.4 years, which means its hazardous life is 10 to 20 times that, depending. And it's, it does most of its damage when it's inhaled or ingested, so therefore incorporated into the human body. Now, you, you couple that with the fact that it seems to collect, according to ICRP, in fetal tissue at twice the concentration that it does in maternal tissue, and you have a real problem because the beta emissions, which have for a long time been calculated a certain way, and I won't get into a whole lot of detail here, um, it now looks like that model may be incorrect and that beta emissions may be responsible for, in certain cases, thousands of times more damage than they've been modeling for up to this point when they are incorporated into the human body. So it's really worth um, looking at Aaron Datesman is his name, Aaron Datesman's work, and it's very detailed, it's, it's very physics and engineering oriented, but it, his work helps to explain why, for instance, at Three Mile Island, the people complained of what seemed to be higher radiation dose symptoms than what were being modeled or recalculated for their doses. So they weren't supposed to be exposed to really high doses, yet their symptoms seem to indicate that they were. And what Datesman's paper basically says, again, without getting into too many weeds, is that they have been miscalculating, particularly incorporated or internally deposited beta doses. Okay, thank you. Right, now we've got a, a this is a general question from Vanessa. So Cindy or Mary or Ian, feel free to come in on this. Uh, Vanessa says, since the climate crisis, some people have been touting nuclear energy as a green solution. Do you believe this is a viable solution or are there still detrimental effects when trying to find somewhere to keep the spent rods and during the regular operation? Anyone want to kick off on that? I'll jump in. 
Yeah. Uh, the first thing I'll say is if you care about meeting climate goals, nuclear is way too expensive. Old nuclear, new nuclear, all nuclear slows us down, costs too much, and makes us sick in the process. It also disproportionately impacts indigenous peoples. There's just so many reasons that nuclear energy should not be considered green in any way, shape, or form. Um, I would direct people to many pieces of literature now, but the classic is Carbon Free, Nuclear Free by Dr. Arjun Makajani. It's a book available from ieer.org, and it makes the case that you cannot meet the climate goals through nuclear. It takes too long, it costs too much. And I think that's where we have to start with the discussion about it. And then remember that we are seeing all this cancer. Where did it all come from? Not just radiation, but certainly radiation has contributed to it and will continue to if we continue to invest in any nuclear technology. Thank you. Uh, Cindy or Ian, anyone? Yes, Cindy? actually, I would like to weigh in um, and point everyone to the currently breaking scandals in Ohio, South Carolina, and Illinois regarding the bailout monies that were given to nuclear, uh, aging nuclear plants, dangerous nuclear plants in the case of Ohio. Um, it, they bribed our officials. So I really do want an energy source where you don't have to bribe our elected officials to cover up what's going on, to stay afloat, steal money from ratepayers. I mean, the whole thing is just completely unconscionable. And, you know, how do we get through to politicians and people like this when they can't hear what we're saying because their ears are too full of illicit monies that they've taken from an industry who too long has ridden on the coattails of being very secretive and not being truthful with what's going on with the waste and with the generation of the power and with all of the effluent that they spew out into our communities and all of the illnesses. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Ian? Yeah, uh, an answer to the, I agree with both um, what Mary and Cindy said, of course, but there seems to be a widespread common view that nuclear is the answer to global warming. And it, it's such an ill-informed view that one shakes one's head in disbelief. Um, I mean, the point is that people look at a reactor and say, well, there's no, no carbon being emitted from the reactor. Yeah, but if you look at how you would get the fuel inside the reactor, um, uranium mining, uranium milling, fuel enrichment, uh, and then if you look at the back end of the, uh, when you take the fuel out of a reactor, and it's all the nuclear waste questions, um, and you add up all the carbon emissions from both before and after, um, you find that per gigawatt hour generated, that nuclear is a lousy way, a truly terrible way to reduce any carbon arising. Now, whilst I'm, I've got the floor cleared, I'd like to just make a little pitch for something. Momentarily. <laughs> okay. This is from Beyond Nuclear in the United States on in reverse order. But this is a leaflet, and I'll read it. Radiation and harm to human health, produced by... Um, uh, beyond nuclear in the United States. And um, we've got hundreds of copies of this in the CND office. And um, we'll undertake, or I'll undertake, to send them out to people who wish to have it. Excellent, excellent primer on radiation risks. It's 19 pages long. Very good. Linda, I hope, who's watching, Linda Gunter, I hope that that uh, will satisfy your request. <laughs> um, and can I also point people to uh, Linda's comments in chat? Um, she's got some uh, helpful links there. And um, Linda, can I just say thanks for yeah, yeah. what you do in this area? It's incredibly helpful for us, particularly. Um, of course, Ian has mentioned something. You said it was 19 pages, which is good. That will give us a lot of information. But if people want a kind of two-sided little leaflet that they can use on stalls. There's, um, we have a number of those available via the CND website. Uh, and Sarah, if you're listening, I don't know if you could put a link up to that if you've got 
a moment in amongst your work there behind the scenes. Um, okay, so let's see. Uh, I've got another question. Linda, who co commented earlier, she said, Kate, this is being recorded, so will it be available for people to show to those who think nuclear is a solution to use instead of fossil fuel? Absolutely. Uh, all our webinars are posted on the CND website, so in a couple of days you will find it there, you'll be able to share it, and of course it is currently being live streamed. So, okay, so there's no more specific questions on that, so I think perhaps we will go on now to the final Oops, I've just, just done something silly to myself. There we are. Okay, so let's go to the final section uh, of our webinar today. And this is where we have a look at future steps and policy recommendations. So thanks to our experts, we've identified what's wrong or as much as we know about what's wrong and why. What kind of policy changes can we put forward um, to, to really see a change here. Can I invite our speakers perhaps to um, make some initial proposals that we could discuss? Who would like to go first? I, I will, it's Cindy. Hi Cindy. Hi, I can talk from the uh, US Environmental Protection Agency perspective, but I have a feeling that what they do is often what's done in other countries as well. So for instance, we need to get rid of the averaging that Mary was talking about. No average with men, with women, children, etc. Uh, EPA doesn't really consider pregnancy at all, so they need to start. I was absolutely appalled when I figured that out. They consider cancer risk, and again, they average, but they don't consider non-cancer impacts. So to that end, for EPA, what I would recommend is they have a toxics hazard index. What I would recommend, and Ian has recommended this for tritium, but I would recommend it for almost all of the radionuclides, a hazard index, a non-cancer hazard index, where they rate um, they rate the danger over lifetime exposure of it giving you cancer. And I think that rather than just doing that with chemicals, EPA also needs to do that with radionuclides. These are things that we actually have asked them to do that we have been pressing for. The funny thing is with EPA, the way that it's organized, the radioactive piece, Office of Radiation, is so insular. It doesn't talk to the Office of Child Health Protection. It doesn't talk to the Environmental Justice Office. It doesn't talk to the toxics people. And so it does its own little thing and it's doing it wrong. It's making a mess of it. And so we're trying to get some sort of bridges built between the radiation people and particularly the child health people who need to inform what's going on in the radiation piece and the radiation area of EPA and they're not they're not doing it. And so that's one thing in the states that, you know, we would really like to be pushing for and have been off and on. So I don't know if that translates over to anything that anyone else is doing, but I think that it's extremely important from a regulatory standpoint. Mm. Absolutely. Mary? Well, yeah, thank you. I agree with what Cindy is talking about, and yet I want to take it a step further. Um, we are going to need a lot of research, funded research, not through my little nonprofit, through the outstanding institutions of excellence that we already have, who are already doing research. We need them to take up these questions on impact of radiation with a life cycle perspective, because my first step that I recommend that be taken, not necessarily the first in time, but in the, in the sense of a temporary next step, is to adopt reference little girl. In the United States, all of our regulations are still set on reference man, who is defined as a male between 25 and 30 years old, a specific height, a specific weight. He has a lifestyle that corresponds to Northern European or North American industrial. He is white. It's all spelled out as to a scenario which is used to determine any radiation evaluation that is done. And our regulations explicitly state this, that it is all based on reference man. Now, it just so happens that that 
age group and that gender is the most resistant part of our um, life cycle. I mean, yeah, there's lower consequences if you're going to die relatively soon. So that's why it goes way down in the uh, elder years because long-term consequences aren't there. So the, the young adult male that underlies reference man is the most resistant place to regulate. So we need to construct ideally that includes reproductive phases of egg, sperm, primary germ cells, embryo, fetus, but we don't really have data sets on that. So we do have the data set that includes the birth to five-year-old girl. We do have the graph I showed. We should be using a girl in that age group to construct a new reference individual. But here's the thing. Our radiation units are based on REM, roentogen man. We're gonna have to really start over in so many respects that to some degree, the idea of, of going to relative risk makes some amount of sense. Um, but if we set standards for everybody based on reference little girl, we will protect reference man and all the males in our, in our population better why not do that? And we will protect little girls at all. So mm -hmm. if we don't go to reference little girl, we have an enormous crack in what is a single life cycle. There aren't a male life cycle and a female life cycle. We have one species life cycle that has two um, lobes, if you will. It's like a beautiful figure eight that goes around between being a male body and a female body, but it's one life cycle. And if we don't protect the whole thing, well, what, you bet, may as well not use the word protection. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd like to agree to uh, what Mary had just said, and also to Cindy too. They're both very good ideas, um, well worthy of future consideration. I'd like to add a third uh, strand, if I may, and that is that the current uh, legal limit for exposure to radiation, annual limit, is one millisievert a year. A millisievert is a, a unit of radiation. Now, that's quite a, a high level, in my view. And we should really be thinking of tightening that level. In other words, uh, making it more strict. Um, perhaps down to, instead of one, down to 0 0.1, 0 0.1 millisieverts a year for uh, women and children, something like that. Um, uh, obviously, um, in a webinar like this, we can't make hard and definite figures. Um, but the point is that we need, we need stricter standards. We need to protect women and children, and we're not doing that right now. So in addition to um, uh, Cindy's recommendation of um, um, a list of uh, how dangerous radionuclides are, and, and also to Mary's a suggestion of uh, a standard little woman or a little girl, I should say. Um, and they're both very good ideas. Uh, the, of, of course, the, well, as Mary says, if you protect little women, you protect everybody or protect little girls, I should say. Very true, very true. I would even go on beyond that and say we need to have standards for right back before being a baby to a neonate to being a um, fetus, to an embryo, have standards for them as well. Because that's where um, those stages are where we are most radio sensitive. I'll stop can I, there. Can I just, um, I think Cindy may want to go in, but I just want to ask for a quick clarification as a, a non-scientist. So in, in practical terms, um, say the exposure level was reduced, where would that apply? Is that for people working or living in the vicinities of nuclear power stations or research reactors or where? You know, where are people exposed generally to radiation and, and what kind of practical restrictions, uh, regulations would be required to bring us into compliance with that lower exposure rate? I want to jump in and, and speak to the regulatory strategic value, and then I'll let Ian and Cindy talk about pathways of exposure and, and that kind of thing. But I, I want to invoke the fact that disproportionate impact of 
radiation on girls and women has already produced uh, grease on a huge wheel that we all love, which is the new uh, treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, um, which is written under the humanitarian law of the world through the United Nations, unlike the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, which is under military law. So the disproportionate impact of radiation on girls and women contributed to making the argument that humanitarian law was appropriate, like the landmine treaty is also under humanitarian law, and therefore under the jurisdiction of the General Assembly, where there is a majority vote, unlike the military law, which is under the Security Council, where there is all those interesting veto powers of the nuclear club. I was on the front row, but I still practically fell over when one of the lead diplomats told me that it was this news, news that radiation is different for males and females that was the icebreaker to restart the conversation on nuclear weapons and was part of the work from 2014 to 2017 to bringing the treaty in. It's not whether you'd fight a nuclear war over the difference between males and females, but it was an icebreaker. It got the conversation restarted. And I believe that similarly, we have in the nuclear club nations, bodies in our civil society that approve funding, they approve licenses for these facilities that are contaminating people. But how do we get at those approvals? If we have a new body of peer reviewed facts, facts matter, and especially peer reviewed facts, showing that the previous decisions were based on ground that no longer holds. If we can rewrite that ground, I think we have a basis for a new generation of policy. And with that new generation of policy, it's not about whether those facilities have better filters, it's whether they're licensed at all. And that's where we need to go. Yes. Because better filters isn't good enough. We want no bomb factories, right? And I honestly believe that this is a mechanism that can re, reinstigate, reinitiate, reset the discussion of whether those previous decisions are appropriate. Thanks very much. Cindy? Yes, so if I could chime in on dovetail on what Mary said, if you're looking at the history, there was in this 1960 report from the um, Federal Radiation Council in the United States a mention of standard child. And they recognized that we should have been setting our standards to a standard child. And after that 1960 report, that concept vanished, but the standard man concept continued. So if you want a little bit of the history, they knew. They knew estrogen was a co-carcinogen through hormones. They knew about standard child. They knew it all. And they were going for an, an acceptable injury limit is what they called it. So they knew that there was no safe dose and they, they had the technologies come online anyway. So knowing that that's the history, we really need to start not just having more research, which Mary is completely correct about. We need to research the estrogen. We need, I think reference embryo is a, is a great way to look at it as well for setting standards, to set it for a pregnancy rather than um, a child that's been born. I think that's a good idea as well, although I completely support reference little girl um, because I think that it's important that we recognize that gender does matter. And I would also like to say that with the science as it is, I think that it's very important to move it to the human rights platform. And in 2013, there was a great report put out by the UN Human Rights Council. They went to Fukushima. They saw the conditions there. They were invited in by the government of Japan. They saw, particularly with regard to women and children, what was happening. And they assessed the situation looking at the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, and they found the circumstances wanting. They still, as of 2018, I believe was the last update, found the circumstances lacking for women and children. They say that risk benefit analysis is not compatible with the right to health framework, particularly with regard to vulnerable populations. So I think that we need to start building these bridges with both new research and science, as Mary says, but also, as she says, with UN bodies, because that's going to be the melding of the human rights that can move us forward, particularly for susceptible 
individuals and life stages. Mm. <laughs> Can I throw in one comment on what you just said, Cindy? Sure. <laughs> yeah. You got to remember that the UN is where the peaceful atom lives. And you and I both know there is no peaceful atom that has gone through fission. So <laughs> it's not like the UN is a clean slate. But I do want to invoke the new generation. We always have a new generation. And right now, with a new millennium, a new century, a new decade, a post-pandemic period, we have great potential for people to be taking leadership and saying, we need to do this better. And so while Cindy points to the fact that some people knew back in 1960, we can't change them, but the people who are rising now have our, the benefit of what we know. And I think it's enough. I think we can take it, hold at both ends, at the prohibition treaty end and also at the decision to license these facilities at all. Mm. What you say made me think then about the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, because this has got this inbuilt contradiction as well, because of course CND supports its uh, non-proliferation and disarmament pillar, you know, and, and we fought at, right up until TPNW was changed the framework, but, you know, very much supportive of the Article 6 in, in the NPT and so on. But alongside that, there is the right enshrined by the UN to uh, nuclear power for civilian, peaceful civilian purposes. So that kind of is a bad atom and a good atom. That story is still there and it needs, it needs a lot of debunking, that's for sure. Um, Ian, did you want to come in on this? Um, I very much, I've been listening with great uh, interest to what both Cindy and uh, Mary have been saying, and I and um, I generally agree with the approach that we should go along the human rights pathway. Um, I'm wary of the UN. The UN has got about what about a dozen major agencies, and their records are hmm, some of them are not very good. <laughs> Some are, but to point to Cindy, some are very good. Uh, um, UNESCO and, and RRHA are very, very good uh, agencies. WHO is also an agency of, of, um, of the United Nations and its record is really spotty. Um, I won't go there right now. I would, um, uh, I'd like to answer a, a point raised by you, Kate, uh, about three or four minutes ago, but you're quite asking, well, where do radiation limits apply? Um, and where are radiation exposures? Um, and the answer is, well, all over. Um, in particular, radiation workers, um, not just those people who work in uh, nuclear weapons factories and uh, nuclear reactors, um, but also classified radiation workers. For example, airline pilots. For example, airline cabin crew. They're radiation workers because they get whopping doses of radiation. Also, workers who work on oil rigs and gas rigs. They also get high doses of radiation. Um, but in addition to that, there are ordinary people who live in areas where there's high levels of radiation in, emanating from um, rock strata, for example, in Britain uh, in Cornwall and uh, up near Aberdeen, they get higher doses of radiation too. Um, so it's a, a rather disparate um, area. And um, the current limit of one millisievert a year is basically, I have to say it's a, a rather arbitrary level um, um, they picked the number one because there was there's so much uncertainty involved in estimating doses that you, it could easily be two or minus one or whatever, uh, or point one, I should say. And so it's very difficult. Um, but um, I would also like to raise something and try and answer a question that one of the uh, questioners in the Q&A raised about background levels of radiation. Um, all of us here on the panel know that um, background radiation is very commonly raised by adherence to nuclear power um, as being a reason that we shouldn't worry about radiation. 
they say, hey, we get lots of background radiation, so what's, what's the worry? Well, I'll tell you what the worry is. It's true that there are background levels of radiation do occur. On average, it's about two and a half to three millisieverts a year here in Britain, on average, big, big variation. And it's about four to four and a half in the United States. Again, um, that's an average. Um, most the major uh, contributor to that is radon from the soil. Now, that doesn't necessarily, that does not mean, because we are all subject to background radiation, it doesn't mean that we should be allowing more radiation and radioactivity from man-made activities. For example, um, I'll give you some other areas where there's um, natural toxins occur. Um, dioxins and furans and ozone, these are just off the top of my head. These are three naturally occurring powerful toxins. Um, furans and dioxins, as you may know, arise during forest fires. Um, but um, they are very, very carcinogenic. Now, nobody in their right mind would say, well, because those chemicals uh, are released in nature, therefore we can release more. But that's what the nuclear industry is saying. And it's a false argument. We mustn't be misled by it. Um, we have to acknowledge the fact that uh, radiation uh, does exist in the background, but um, our struggle or our um, campaigns to, to try and reduce the amount of radiation and radioactivity that we're all exposed to should continue. I'll finish Thanks, that. Ian. Thank you very much. Uh, now we're rapidly coming to the end, but, Lynn, but uh, Cindy has indicated she'd like to answer Linda's question uh, live. So I'm going to go to Cindy and then Mary, you're indicating you want to speak after that. So if I could take you two and then we'll uh, go to a close. Cindy first. Sure. So uh, Linda's question is about uh, the role of UN rapporteurs, and she says that their reports have been highly critical most of the time and right on spot, and she is correct about that. I think that we pick our battles with the UN and we choose to use what we can. I really do believe, and I think that others would agree with me, that, for instance, uranium mining is a human rights violation and it's an indigenous rights violation. I think there's argument to be made that nuclear power power and weapons and their affluence or pollution is violating women and children's rights because of the disproportionate impact. I do think that we could use these arguments along with the rapporteur reports. This one on Fukushima was amazing and it was groundbreaking and I suggest that everyone look at it. Um, and I think that we could move this issue forward. And I think that we should get rid of Article 4 if we could possibly manage it, the inalienable right to develop nuclear power. Well, who are you killing to do that? <laughs> Good so point. That's, right. And one, one other thing real quick, the one millisievert limit I really dislike because what it does in essence is it doubles the dose. I'm not talking about radon because radon can be mitigable. And in the United States, people put things on the side of their house to get rid of their radon out of their house. So you can take care of most of your radon exposure, at least in the US, I don't know about Britain, but that one millisievert then is in essence doubling the rest of your natural background dose. If that is in addition to what you get background per year. So one millisievert is too high. Yep, I agree. Thanks, I want to dive in and point to a different parallel. I totally agree with my colleagues. Everything that's been said is, is on target. Here's one more possible parallel, and that is to tobacco. If we get just a few more peer-reviewed yes. papers, we could ask uh, officials like in the United States, we have a Surgeon's General. I would love to have everything labeled to say that your CAT scan is potentially more harmful to a female than to a male. If you are a parent, that your little boy is potentially less harmed than your little girl. Your airplane ticket, same information. Every possible place that radiation is happening, I would love to have a disclosure label as an opportunity to get around these institutions that are so embedded in their own um, falsehoods. And so 
you know, a little more research, and I'm not talking about in my organization, I'm talking about in universities at Cambridge, at Oxford, at Stanford, at Duke, papers written by people getting their PhDs. We need a new generation of independent researchers. We need to have these questions answered. Let's use the gender factor to move the money, get the research done, and then let's just go for it. This is absolutely a new opportunity. Let's take it. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. And thank you so much, all three of you, for really sharing such detailed information, making it so accessible, and I'm sure motivating everyone to really get active on this. Uh, there's lots of links there and useful uh, contacts put in, in the chat. Um, this, this whole webinar will be available on CND's website. We can also, if the chat, if people haven't been able to copy the chat, then we'll make sure that those details are available too. And if either or all three of you have got some recommended reading that you'd like to suggest uh, for the participants today and our members and supporters, then please do feel free to send that in. And can I urge all you marvellous participants, by the way, sorry, there were so many questions, we haven't been able to answer them all. But thank you for joining us today. Thank you for your support for CND. And if you can, please do get active around this issue. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye-bye.